and I'm happy to introduce uh, Owen Lurie. He is a historian with Maryland State Archives, uh, and we were put in contact uh, uh, very recently uh, by a colleague, so I was very interested to see that he's been in charge since 2013 of the project Finding the Maryland 400, which is a collaboration with the Maryland Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. And that's studying those soldiers who helped save Washington's <laughs> Continental Army at the Battle of Brooklyn. Owen has a BA in American Studies from Kenyon College and an MA in History from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I have friends who went to both of those colleges, so it's great to see <laughs> them represented. Um, and without further ado, I am going to uh, mute my camera, or shut off my camera, mute my microphone and turn the presentation over to Owen. Hit him, hit him in the chat with any questions that you have and we'll be back on later to answer those for you. Owen, please take it away. Well, Chris, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's really nice to have a chance to tell this story to as many people as I can, um, to tell this story to people who are from not from in Maryland. I have been uh, was telling Chris, I've been telling this story in Maryland for a little while now. Um, but this is an opportunity to work with the American Battlefield Trust, an organization with a, a much wider reach and a much wider focus. And so it's really nice to be part of that. Um, it's an organization which has a really nice mission, which I've been, um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm really pleased to be able to be part of their, their, their event um, and to help contribute to all the wonderful work that they do um, in, in some small way by speaking here today. Um, they're, they're, the American Battlefield Trust, uh, the battle summaries and the maps are phenomenal. They're such a, they're my go-to reference whenever I need to double check something real quick, just to, to, to make sure I've got the right information. Um, we don't have any uh, revolutionary war sites in Maryland, but there are, are I know there are some sites uh, that have been preserved by the trust in, out in Western Maryland, uh, civil war sites from the, uh, the Confederate invasions in, in what, 1862 and 64, I guess. Um, but it is really nice to see, just looking at the conference lineup, that there's a good turnout from uh, American Revolution and from, from Revolutionary Era presenters as well, which is always, always very heartening. Sometimes it feels that the, uh, the Civil War takes uh, all the oxygen out of the room. Um, or in Maryland, where we spent um, so long doing the War of 1812 Bicentennial, uh, it was not always the easiest time to be running a Revolutionary War project. Um, but I, I have been aided along the way by some really wonderful partners, and I, I would be remiss if I did not take an opportunity to, to recognize and to thank um, our supporters with the Maryland Society of the Sons of the American Revolution, who have been, been behind us all the way, have been working with us um, almost since the very beginning. Um, and we've also had some other wonderful partners, including Washington College in, in Chestertown, Maryland, who have been so generous with their funding um, and who have done been so helpful in, in with us finding um, interns and employees to help us out with the project. As Chris mentioned, I've been working on this project since 2013 um, with the goal of studying the soldiers from Maryland who fought with such courage and renown at the Battle of Brooklyn in August 1776. Um, sometimes it's called the Battle of Long, of Long Island um, but it, it took place in the area that is right in the heart of Brooklyn today. So we, we like to call it the Battle of Brooklyn to help ground it in its physical location. It was the first major battle of the American Revolution. Um, There's a little bit of fighting up in New England beforehand, but this was the first major battle and it was by, by far the biggest battle in the Revolutionary War. And it was a monumental American defeat. The Continental Army allowed itself to be surrounded and was nearly destroyed entirely. It is only a desperate last stand made up largely of soldiers from Maryland, um, who we now call the Maryland 400. They hold the British off long enough for the rest of the Americans to escape, essentially. They, they put themselves between the British and the escaping Americans. In the course of the battle, 256 Marylanders were either killed or captured. Um, we don't really have a good handle on how many were killed versus how many were captured or who they were. There, there was a list that was kept by the army, but it has long since disappeared. The first thing that I should tell you about the project, if, if you don't remember anything else about the Maryland 400 today, you should re remember that there were not really 400 soldiers from Maryland. 
the term Maryland 400 uh, comes from the Victorian era. Um, it's possibly in allusion to the Spartan 300, uh, the soldiers from the movie who hold the Persians back at the Battle of Thermopylae, or possibly to Lady Astor's 400, the listing of New York high society's most exclusive families of the Gilded Age. Um, and I, that the Lady Astor connection is, it may not have been the only inspiration for the name Maryland 400, but it's certainly a very important component of it, that both terms come into use at about the same time, so the, the late 1880s, very early 1890s. And there are at, le at least a few people who make an explicit connection that I have seen between, you know, in New York, they have their 400 people who matter, which is the, the richest, uh, most exclusive group. But in, in Maryland, our 400, our people who matter, uh, are these men who fought in the Revolutionary War <clears throat> and who, who saved the army at, at the Battle of Brooklyn. There were, in fact, somewhere around a thousand soldiers from Maryland at the battle. We don't know exactly how many there were. Um, we don't know everyone's name. There are some gaps in the records and some, some administrative problems, uh, some of the same administrative problems, which play at least a, a bit of a role in the loss. But using the muster rolls and enlistment records that survive, using uh, veterans pensions, pay accounts, uh, miscellaneous receipts and correspondence, in a few cases, wills, we have compiled the names of 872 of them. We have them all listed on our project website. You can see the, the address right there. Um, or I, I like to say that the fastest way to find our website is to Google Maryland 400 um, we should be the second result after Wikipedia. And I think that's about as high as anyone can really expect to shoot these days. We completed our work about a year and a half ago of writing biographies for each of these 872 known soldiers. Um, they are, you can read the biographies on the website, um, look at our project blog, which will have posts about the soldiers themselves um, and other topics about the revolution, Maryland, Maryland military history and things like that. For many years, the Maryland 400 has been best remembered as a group, um, really to the extent that they're remembered at all. But they have always remained nearly anonymous as individuals. Certainly, as you can see a few examples, there were some famous people in the unit who went on to great renown and prominence uh, in Maryland after the war. So uh, three of them were governor, um, and actually most of them had pretty consequential terms in office. Um, Samuel Smith was uh, in Congress as a Senator and a representative for 30 years. Um, there were, in addition to these four, there were a number of militia commanders and generals um, who led the Maryland militia during the War of 1812. Um, sort of a, a mixed group in terms of success in that war, but still. Um, but our goal has been really to move beyond that, to move beyond the, this, this famous group. Um, to uh, uncover as much as we can about who all of these soldiers were. So our, our project for the first time put together a list with everybody in the regiment, um, or as many of them as we could find. And to, to put together as much as we can about their lives, whether we can learn just the bare bones of their military career, um, whether we can uncover things about their private lives. And we're, we're trying to, as much as we can, to answer questions like, who were their wives and children? Um, what was their profession? Were they, were they farmers? Were they skilled tradesmen? Were they itinerant laborers? And we also look at how these soldiers and these veterans were touched by the larger trends in American history. So we look at the ways that they were affected by the economic troubles in the 1780s and the 1790s. Um, how many of them end up moving to Kentucky or Ohio in search of more land? Um, how many of them move from the, the rural parts of Maryland into big cities like Baltimore? In the course of our work, um, excuse me, in the course of our work, we have uncovered some wonderful and really touching stories about all these soldiers. And I'll share a few of them um, at the end. Um, or close it further into this talk. But to begin with, I'd like to talk a little bit about who they were as a group, what Maryland's Revolutionary War contingent looked like, um, 
and perhaps what you might have seen if you had been there in Annapolis, in, in the capital city of Maryland, on July 9th, 1776, watching these men, watching the 1st Maryland Regiment march out to defend New York. Um, that's what's being shown in this picture here, which is just an absolutely gorgeous image. Um, and I will, will tell you, having seen it in person, this reproduction just doesn't really do it justice. It's just an absolutely beautiful painting. Most of what is shown in the painting has no basis in reality at all, um, unfortunately. There, nobody would have been wearing those, those familiar blue uniforms, um, certainly not in, seven, in the beginning of 1776. And there's no need for anyone to have been on horseback because they went the first part of their journey by boat. Um, but still, it's a nice painting and it gives, a, I think, uh, a sense of, of the military presence in Annapolis. Annapolis was overwhelmed by soldiers in the, in the summer of 1776. There were easily at least a thousand soldiers in the city, which more or less doubled the, the city's population. Among these soldiers, among the Maryland Regiment, there were only four with any prior combat experience. Um, two of them, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Ware, who's the second in command under William Smallwood, um, and Captain Barton Lucas had been young junior officers in the French and Indian War way back in 1758, 1758 fighting out in Western Pennsylvania. And two others, Major Thomas Price and probably Private Nathan Peake had been part of a group of riflemen that Maryland had raised from the mountains and sent out to Boston in the summer of 1775, um, where they would have had at least a little bit of combat experience, um, mostly exchanging pot shots with the British that, that winter. Um, but of course, none of those four men ended up being on the battlefield in, in August of 1776. The soldiers who marched out, they were under the command of William Smallwood, um, were all men, of course, but there were plenty of women who would have been traveling with the army as well. Men brought their, commonly brought their wives or even their families, and armies attracted plenty of unattached women as well. These were women who cooked, washed laundry, sold supplies to the soldiers. Um, for some of them, it was a simple matter of economics. A family couldn't afford the loss of a man's income while he was away in the service. Um, a, a single woman or a woman with young children couldn't run a farm by herself, um, couldn't support herself any other way. Colonel Josias Carvel Hall, commander of the 4th Maryland Regiment, explained the problem in, in, in 1779. He wrote, a soldier's pay will not, will not enable him to maintain a family at home, which compels him to bring them to his regiment, where they may share his rations, though little enough for himself. This frequently subjects the brave soldier to punishment by so powerfully interfering with his military duty, and besides, it greatly encumbers the march of the army. An experience of these inconveniences prevents the most considerate and the best of our soldiers from re-enlisting. Um, he writes this in 1779 as the Maryland line is facing a severe manpower shortage, all of their enlistments are about to expire. So he knew what he meant. We know only a little bit about who these women were, um, especially in 1776, we really, there's really not a lot um, that we can say about them. We know that one of them was a woman named Margaret Jane Ramsey, who was the wife of Captain Nathaniel Ramsey commander of the 5th Company of Smallwood's Regiment. She was also the sister of Charles Wilson Peel and uh, uh, James Peel, both of them uh, noted artists. Um, James was actually uh, an officer in the same regiment. She didn't travel with the army on its initial march to New York, but she joined it soon after the Battle of Brooklyn in early September, saying that she would rather be with the army, whatever might be her sufferings, than to be at a distance and be so much tormented for if she was near the army, in case of misfortunes, she might possibly be able to help those most dear to her. She ultimately traveled with the army for the entire time that her husband served, um, and he rose to be uh, the colonel, or lieutenant colonel. Um, and during that time, she functioned as the unofficial hostess for all the Maryland officers. The soldiers from Maryland in 1776 were young. It's not terribly surprising when you consider any army. Um, especially when you think about a country with a very young population. Um, the youth, I think, still is pretty striking, especially when you look at the officer, at the officer corps. 
Daniel Bowie was either 20 or 21 when he was made a captain. Well, William Start and William Frazier were 19 year old lieutenants. Nathaniel Ramsey was 35, which is about the typical age for a captain and for, for all senior officers, but his junior officers were 18 and 22. And notably, those younger officers ended up taking on leadership roles. So for example, William Sterrett was the first lieutenant, um, but his captain was sick at the Battle of Brooklyn. So Sterrett, a 19 year old lieutenant with not a day of combat experience, uh, ended up leading his company. The median age of the Marylanders who fought at Brooklyn was 24. Um, though the foreign born on tended to be on average a little bit older, about 26 or 27. From what we know, the regiment was somewhere between 20 and 30% foreign born, um, mostly men from Ireland, um, some English, um, and the, some, some clusters of Germans, which I'll actually talk about a little bit later. The men who marched out with Smallwood um, that, that day in July were almost certainly all white, though it's a little hard to say for sure. Um, this may be the only time in 18th century records, or certainly in 18th and 19th century Maryland, where race wasn't noted, where the, somebody who was African-American wasn't denoted as such. We know that the flying camp, um, which was a short-term uh, reserve force raised in later in 1776, had at least a handful of African-American soldiers. Um, we, many more African-Americans would serve in the Maryland line. Um, it seems as though every infantry regiment from Maryland was integrated, uh, including the German regiment, which was in theory open only to people from uh, with ethnic German heritage. In the first year of the war, so the first group of men uh, who Maryland raises, the state found it could raise enough troops with only white soldiers, which is really what they wanted. Um, as the war progressed and, and fewer white men were eager to volunteer, the state was, became more willing to accept uh, African-Americans uh, both free and eventually enslaved. Um, basically, the problem boils down to the fact that for uh, sensible or for, for um, um, upper class white Maryland society, the scariest thing that they could imagine was armed African Americans. So they resisted as long as they could. But Maryland had to meet its quota of soldiers, and they did it the, the only way they could. We shouldn't think, though, that the army camp was all white, though. Uh, this is something that's important to point out. Just as there were women who attended um, the march of the army, we know that wealthy men in the, among the officer corps traveled with enslaved men or women to serve them. Um, we know that some of the, we know that happened um, and it shouldn't really even be that, be that much of a surprise given what we know about aristocratic Maryland, uh, in, about aristocratic people from Maryland. They, they, they wouldn't think of, of traveling without somebody to, to serve them. So just to give you a little bit of uh, um, orientation to Maryland, if you're, if you're not familiar with, with those of us in the seventh state. Um, so the first Maryland regiment, um, the, the Smallwood soldiers were raised from all across the state um, in early 1776. And then they were gathered um, some in Annapolis right over here, and then some in Baltimore, uh, Baltimore town or Baltimore city. Um, and they spent the first six months of the year training there. Then when they finally depart, they travel by boat for the first part of the trip to um, what is now called Elkton, Maryland, up here at the very top of the Chesapeake Bay. And then they travel on foot to first to Philadelphia and then on to New York, about 15 to 20 miles a day. Um, and the route they took is actually pretty easy to document because you can track the, their expense accounts and their receipts. And they more or less went right up Route 1, which is how uh, anyone would do it. Um, it took them about a week to reach Philadelphia. And while they're there, William Sands, a 19 year old sergeant from Annapolis, took a moment to write a letter, which is what you see here, to his parents, John and Ann Sands, with news of the, of the journey. Sands's dispatch on the march to New York um, are really special, they're really important. There are only a few firsthand accounts of this trip at all. Um, and only one of them comes from a common soldier, from, uh, he was from an enlisted man. The rest are all reports from officers and were mostly written to tell the state government what was happening. And so Sands' um, accounts fill a really important hole that we don't have uh, otherwise. 
So this dispatch from July 20th, 1776, it feels to me exactly like what you would expect. This is a teenager, um, newly enlisted in the army, um, away from home, perhaps for the first time in his life. And so he's passing on news from a friend of the family to his parents. Um, and he describes um, how in regards to some unnamed woman, he reassures his parents, he was very sorry anybody should raise such false reports. He, he assured them, the girl is not in company with me. She's along with the soldiers in the barracks with five more women. I have nothing to say to her and I hope you will not think any more of it. So we, we unfortunately do not know who this, this uh, any of these women are or what these reports were. But evidently uh, matters were afoot that were not suitable for a respectable son of prominent citizens of Annapolis. Otherwise, um, Sand said, as for news, I have none to acquaint you with, but that we expect to go from here to New York tomorrow, and that when we get to camp, I shall write. We are all in good spirits. So this is a young man who, on an adventure almost, when you think about it that way. Three weeks later, the regiment finally makes it to New York. And Smallwood kept his word and wrote again to his parents. By then, the earlier anecdotes had given way to really more clear-eyed um, clear reports, I guess, of military preparation. He spoke of the measures being taken to resist the British um, from attacking New York City. Um, he estimated that there were some 200 ships in the harbor. Yesterday, he wrote, the enemy had a reinforcement of that damned rascal Dunmore's fleet, as we expect. There was about 40 sail. So this is Lord Dunmore, the former and the deposed colonial governor of Virginia, who had raised a unit of African-American soldiers of, um, of escaped enslaved men who Dunmore promised freedom to um, if they could escape to him, which earned him undying enmity for many in America. Sands continued, we are ordered to hold ourselves in readiness. We expect an attack hourly. We have lost a good many of our troops. They have deserted from us at Philadelphia and Elizabethtown, and a great many are sick in the hospital. There is rations given out at New York for 6,000 men daily, probably actually a great deal more than that. I should be glad if you will write to me the first opportunity and let me know the news, if there is any in that part of the country. We expect, please God, to winter in, in Annapolis, those that live of us. That battle that he anticipated came about two weeks later on August 27th. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of the general orientation of the Battle of Brooklyn. Um, and then we'll sort of start to tell some of the stories that we could, that, that come to us from it, where it's, it's amazingly fortunate that in ways that other battles um, that the Maryland line fights in, really don't have this. Um, there are a real wealth of firsthand accounts of the Battle of Brooklyn from the men who fought in it. So the Marylanders get to New York in the beginning of August. They, they join the American army, which has somewhere around 10,000 men, though the Americans never quite figure out how many people they have. Um, many of the Marylanders, like many of the other people in the Continental, in the Continental Army, get sick because the Americans don't even know how to run a camp properly to keep everyone from getting dysentery. And there are some, some just amazing complaints from some of the commanding officers about how disgusting and, and undisorderly the American camp is. The British have been gradually arriving in the region sort of the whole summer, knowing that New York is, is the best place to attack. Um, just sort of gradually staging troops until, until they're really ready. And then on August 22nd, they land somewhere around 20,000 men on right, sort of right where the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is, if you're good at New York geography. And the American leadership, George Washington and his commanders, they're not sure what to make of this. They're not sure how many British soldiers have landed, um, in part because the locals on that part of Long Island aren't interested in telling the Americans what's happening because they actually support the British still. still. And so Washington thinks it might be a diversion um, or that they're, even if it's where all the British soldiers have landed, they might be heading somewhere else. And so it takes a while for the Americans to really figure out 
where to go and how to respond to this British threat. And so it's not until August 26th that the Americans actually figure out that this is the main British army and that the attack really is happening here. And they dispatch some soldiers from Maryland. They, they, they dispatch some soldiers come over from Manhattan, um, including the Marylanders. Now, at the time the Marylanders are sent over to Long Island or towards what is now Brooklyn, two of their senior commanders, um, Colonel Smallwood and Lieutenant Colonel Ware, are serving on the jury for a court-martial. The, the Americans have caught this sort of hapless German officer um, trying to sell secrets to the British. And Washington is determined sort of with a, a very single-mindedness to dispose of this matter once and for all without waiting um, until after whatever battle was coming. And so he, doesn't, he sends over several regiments without their senior commanders because the commanders are sitting on this military jury. Um, and Smallwood later writes that how angry they all were and they were just besides themselves meeting with Washington to be allowed to accompany their troops. Instead, uh, the Marylanders ended up being commanded on the battlefield by this gentleman, Major Mordecai Gist, the third in command of the regiment. Gist was a 33-year-old Baltimore merchant. He was extraordinarily wealthy. He had been active in Maryland revolutionary politics for a number of years. He was one of the more militant members of the Maryland revolutionary um, leadership. He had raised a pro-independence militia in late 1774 um, called the Baltimore Independent Cadets. He had he and his supporters had been instrumental in the burning of the Peggy Stewart, um, a ship which had brought tea into Maryland um, in contravention of the, of the boycott. Gist, of course, has no real military experience because all his militia had done previously was parade about in Baltimore and occasionally harass suspected loyalists. Nevertheless, he takes, he takes command. So here, just to get a sense of the lay of the land, um, this is a, a gorgeous map. I hope it's, it's big enough when you're looking at it on your own computers at home. Um, so a little orientation. Up here at the top is Manhattan. This little shaded bit at the bottom, um, amusingly enough, is the only place that anybody lives. Um, the Hudson River is here and the East River is here. The area we now call Brooklyn or Brookland right here. The American line runs sort of in a semicircle from here all the way around to this end. Um, there's some, some fortified American camp is behind them. The Marylanders are this group highlighted in blue, which are on the very far right end of the American lines. It's a fairly uh, important position. They're sort of on one side, they're, they're right up against the coast. So as, as I said, there are some just really terrific um, firsthand accounts of the Battle of Brooklyn from the men who fought in it. And I'm gonna let them tell the story. They tell it better than I ever could. And so we begin with Gist. We began our march, he wrote, to the right of the battlefield at th about three o'clock in the morning with 1,300 men um, made up uh, from Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And about sunrise, we discovered the enemy. There was a, another soldier from the fifth company um, presumably one of the officers. The enemy th then advanced towards us, upon which uh, Lord Sterling, uh, the American general on that side of the battlefield, immediately drew us up in a line and offered them battle in the true English taste. The British army then advanced within about 300 yards of us and began a very heavy fire from their cannons and their mortars, for both the balls and the shells flew very fast, now and then taking off ahead. Our men stood it amazingly well. Not even one of them showed a disposition to shrink. Our orders were not to fire until the enemy came within 50 yards of us. When the British perceived we stood their fire so coolly and resolutely, they declined to coming any nearer, although they were triple our numbers. In this situation, we stood from sunrise till 12 o'clock, the enemy firing upon us the chief part of the time. That was William McMillan, who was a a uh, corporal in the fourth company and an immigrant from, a young immigrant from Scotland. We had a pretty severe fight with Jaegers, which was a group of Hessian soldiers, and it was a draw battle. There was a good many on each side killed. They retreated and we did not pursue them. 
just felt that our men behaved well and maintained their ground until the enemy retreated about 200 yards and halted. The firing on each, on each side ceased. So the British, the British withdraw, the Marylanders feel that they have weathered their true test of soldiers. They had faced the enemy, they had faced fear British regulars and the enemy had backed down after real combat. In truth, however, the attack that the Maryland troops had faced was only a diversion. And the real, the rest of the British army, the main body of their troops, including a large number of feared Scottish Highlanders um, eager to put down this American revolt, just as their own Scottish revolt had been put down 30 years before, uh, was in the process of slipping around the other side, the left end of the American lines. So you can see that they march from where they land on the coast, down along the road, over to the side, and down this road, which is guarded according to tradition by four or six Americans on horseback, um, Washington having forgotten to defend the, that road. Or as the Americans thought, the main body of their army by a route we had never dreamed of had entirely surrounded and scattered all of our men except the Delaware and Maryland battalions. Macmillan wrote, we were surrounded by Heelanders on one side, Hessians on the other. On the left side of the battlefield, the American lines more or less crumble and people begin to retreat in panic. The Marylanders and the Delaware soldiers are on the other end of the battlefield from that. Um, so they're a little distance away Things are better over there, and they actually maintain their position a little bit longer. Um, and so rather than retreat and panic, they actually are ordered to withdraw with the hope of that they can live to fight an, another day. Or as Gist, Gist said, being thus surrounded with no probability of reinforcement, uh, his lordship ordered me to retreat with the remaining part of our men and to force our way through to our camp. So the idea being that if they can get back to the fortified American lines, they will be safe for at least a little while. So they, they head down this road and they get to this area, which is very marshy. And then there's a, a creek and a mill pond um, was what was then called Gowanus Creek or now the Gowanus Canal, one of the most polluted places in America. As, as one soldier wrote, we were ordered to attempt a retreat by fighting our way through the enemy, who at the time nearly filled every field and every road between us and our lines. We had not retreated but a quarter of a mile when we were fired upon by an advanced group of party of the enemy, while those upon our rear played upon us with their artillery. Our men fought with more than Roman courage, and I am convinced would have stood until we were shot to a, down to a man. We forced the advanced party, which first attacked us, to give way. By this point, the court martial um, has uh, ended, obviously. Um, and so Smallwood is released from his duty on the jury, but is, it, is, it is too late. He can't get to his troops. And so he and the other officers are standing on the high ground above the battlefield watching. Um, as he wrote later to the Maryland uh, government, there then remained no other prospect for their troops but to surrender or attempt to retreat over this marsh or creek where no person before had ever been known to cross. And indeed, the soldier from the fifth company notes, um, confirms that we got passage down the side of a marsh, seldom before waded over, which we passed and then swam a narrow river, all the time exposed to the fire of the enemy. Samuel Smith, who was at the time a 24 year old captain uh, from Baltimore, later a Senator and general in the war of 1812, he wrote that I took my company through a marsh until we were stopped by the dam of a mill that was too deep uh, for them to force. They get to the mill pond. I and the sergeant swam over and got two slabs of wood into the water on which we ferried over all the men who could not swim. We know that the Marylanders lose a handful of soldiers who drown in the process of this um, and that they had in, somehow had managed to capture a a handful of British soldiers and a few of those prisoners also drowned as they're trying to cross through the water. 
So the Marylanders, so here's a, a detail of that, that earlier map. So they get down about this way and about half the regiment is able to cross and escape through the swamp. Um, that includes the fifth and the eighth companies. So the two of the men we've heard from, um, but the other half of the regiment, uh, which actually includes William McMillan's group, um, doesn't have a chance to get across because another group of British soldiers em emerged from the, the smoke um, and open fire. And so they're forced to head down this direction, looking for another place to get back to camp. And they end up where you, this, this big red X is. As Gis reported, Gis reported, we were then left with only five companies of our battalion, so about half the regiment, when the enemy returned. After a warm and close engagement of near 10 minutes, our troops became so disordered that we were under the necessity of retreating to a piece of woods over on our right. We formed and we made a second attack, but being overpowered by numbers and surrounded on all sides by at least, he thought, 20,000 men, we were pushed back in much confusion. The impracticability of forcing through such a formidable body of troops rendered it the height of rashness and imprudence to risk the lives of our remaining party in a third attempt. And it became necessary for us to endeavor to effect our escape in the best manner we could. So they head, they, they head off back towards, um, through the swamp or through the creek, somehow back to the American lines. Um, Gist is one of those who does manage to escape and some of the men he's with managed to escape. Um, but a very high number of the men who take part in this desperate stand, the, the stand of the Maryland 400, were killed or captured in this. Um, you may, if you know a little bit about the battle, you may have heard that there are, um, that the Marylanders make six charges against the British, um, which there are some sources that say that the Gist was their commander. He only says two, but I, I think we should take a moment to recognize, and I know many of the people watching this today are, are people with some understanding of, of military history and of what 18th century combat looked like, what it means for a group of raw recruits, men who have marched on fields at home, but who have never seen combat, are able to form twice while under heavy fire um, and mount attacks against a very well-disciplined body of soldiers. And that's a really remarkable thing. It shows great training and great courage by the Marylanders in this, in this action. Um, and so while we don't know for certain that the Marylanders and that small and that that Sterling's uh, counterattack was specifically intended to hold the British back long enough to let the rest of the Americans retreat. Um, and I mean, in some ways, we, we, we can't guess how we, we don't know how how Sterling could possibly have guessed they would have that effect. But it does. And their, their stand is really a remarkable thing. It, it shows great courage and great discipline among the Maryland line. I, when we started this project, I thought that was all just sort of home state boosterism that, you know, Maryland is the best at everything. Um, but it, it, when you look at, at, what, at what actually happened, it, it really is um, that impressive. McMillan describes the aftermath. My brother and I and 50 or 60 of us was taken. The Hessians who captured them broke the butts of our guns over their cannon, robbed us of everything we had, lit their pipes with our money, gave us nothing to eat for five days, and then just moldy biscuits, blue moldy, full of bugs and rot. If you look at, at the total numbers of soldiers who were lost, that looking at how many men were there, would have been there in a full strength company, and how many um, were, were lost at the battle. So uh, Bowie's unit lost almost 80%. That the, the highlighted companies um, are the ones who took part in this desperate last stand, and they lose between 60 and 80% of their men. This is astounding losses. I do, um, I, I should once again emphasize that it, though it is, you will see sometimes said 256 Marylanders were killed that day, and that, that it really isn't true. Um, we unfortunately know very little about who was killed or who was captured. Uh, we know the names only of four men who were killed. Um, Mostly, um, mostly officers. So Captains Bowie and Vizi were killed. Um, Lieutenant Butler, who was Bowie's uh, second in command, um, and one of, both of those were McMillan's officers were killed. Um, and sadly, uh, William Sands, who had dreamed of uh, wintering in Annapolis, was also among those who were killed. 
So just to sort of uh, take us through the rest of the uh, summer and the fall of 1776, um, the Americans are safe in their camp for the next day or so. Um, after the battle, there is a massive rainstorm which slows the British down. And the British also were in no particular hurry to attack the, the very well defended American lines. They were, first the British understood that the to attack such a heavily fortified position would require real preparations. Um, and the memories of Bunker Hill, where the British marched wave after wave of men um, cut down by, by American uh, gunfire, um, the, the, the ghosts of Bunker Hill stayed with the British Army for, for a long time. So they were not eager to attack this heavily fortified American camp. And the British also didn't really think that they needed to hurry. They, they fight one battle against the, this, this Continental Army and they're immediately defeated. And you know, what's the hurry? We're, we'll get George Washington soon enough. Um, late on the night of August 29th and into early August, or excuse me, late on the night of August 28th and into early August 29th, the Americans realize that they can't stay where they are and they begin to, to slip back um, under cover of darkness back towards Manhattan. And they have to do this very carefully and very quietly because the British have an enormous war fleet positioned just off the coast, just offshore. And as the Americans gradually row themselves across, which is what's, what's shown in this image here, back to Manhattan, they run out of time and the sun begins to rise on, on the morning of the 29th. And miraculously, this dense fog, sort of a, uh, a result of the rain and the temperature, covers the area. It's so deep, you, it's so thick, you can only see 10 yards, say some of the soldiers. And it, it's, it's, like, it's like something out of a movie. Um, you know, it, it, this really, this is a movie. This is Dunkirk, right? Um, only it's, only in one day and it's everybody gets home safe um, and everyone gets across because this, the fog doesn't begin to break until all the Americans are back across. The Marylanders are reportedly um, among the last to leave. They are once again, um, not for the first time nor for the last time, left to cover the retreat for the rest of the Continental Army. They spend the rest, the Americans spend the rest of the fall getting gradually pushed out of New York. Um, they, they have some moments um, where they, they show some hope and some promise on the battlefield um, at White Plains and places like that. But really the rest of the year is a disaster. Um, it's not until the very end of 1776 and beginning of 1777 um, at Trenton and at Princeton that the Americans sort of turn the tide and that they, they show some, some real fight. Most of the Americans who were captured um, were held in New York City. They were held first, um, as, as some of our Marylanders tell us, they were held first on prison ships in New York Harbor, and then probably sometime in November when the Americans are chased out of Manhattan for good, they were moved into makeshift prisons in New York City, which were really just deplorable uh, conditions. We, the best estimate is that there's about a 50% casualty rate among Americans captured at the Battle of the Brooklyn. 50% die that first winter of 76, 77. Most of the Maryland prisoners are very fortunate that they get released um, during that winter, they're, that there's a prisoner exchange. The British didn't really want to have all these prisoners, didn't have anything to do with them. So we know that somewhere around 70, um, Ameri 70 Marylanders are released by the British um, that winter of 76, 77. Though most of the Marylanders were held in New York, at least a handful, like uh, William and his brother Samuel McMillan, were sent to Nova Scotia. As McMillan related, the British put us aboard prison ships and sent us to Halifax up in Nova Scotia. We were, oops, sorry, I was getting a little ahead of myself. Um, where we were till the next spring, and then sometime in April, 10 of us ran away from Halifax. We were then 10 weeks in the wilderness, sometimes with nothing to eat for days, but the moss that grows on the rocks and the bays, sometimes shellfish or snails. We suffered everything but death. So this party of, of, of escaped Americans gradually worked their way on foot around the Bay of Fundy, 
um, they get to a small town in the sort of the northeastern coast of Maine. They get a ride by boat from some local militia commanders, um, first to Portland in Maine, and then to Boston, where amazingly both William and Samuel re-enlist. They join a Massachusetts unit. Um, they serve for the rest, for most of the rest of the war together. Um, though eventually William leaves the Massachusetts unit when he when they are stationed in the same place as the Marylanders, um, gets a, according to him, an officer's commission in the Maryland line um, and serves the rest of the war in, with Maryland. And as a result, according to Massachusetts, he's still a deserter. So I'm gonna take a little, a little time now to talk about some of the stories that we've uncovered, sort of look at some of these men um, who we've been able to learn about. And you know, we have 870 something um, men. And so that they, among them, they show a real diversity of, of, of experiences and, and of sort of the full scale of humanity really. Um, so they range from Alicia Everett, who was a private in 1776. He served one year and then he went home. When he was arrested in 1778 in Maryland for horse theft, he was given the opportunity to join the army instead of facing punishment for his crime. Um, and he, he takes the, the chance, he re-enlists and deserts again within a few months. They capture him soon afterwards. The, the, the officer in charge of rounding up deserters writes this letter talking about how every is the worst soldier he's ever seen. There's no reason for him to be in the army and he's just going to desert again. Um, and in, Everett eventually gets a, a substitute and doesn't, doesn't serve the rest of his term. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is Peter McNaughton, who was a sergeant in the Ninth Company, um, who enlists in the very beginning of 76, and is, as far as the records show, the longest serving member of the Maryland line. He's captured at the Battle of the Brooklyn, with many in his company, was impressed into a British Army unit from which he escaped back to the American uh, camp in the winter of 1778, so two years later, rejoins the Marylanders and serves with them for the rest of the war and the fights in the Southern campaign in the 1780s until not discharged until the very end of 1783. But I'm gonna highlight, I think I have time for three people. One of them is Daniel Bowie, um, who, as I mentioned before, he was a captain in, in who one, one of the men who we know was killed in the battle. When he was made a, he, when he was made a captain, he was either 20 or 21, and there's some inconsistencies in the records we get his age from. He had been raised on a plantation in Prince George's County, Maryland, um, the second of three children, the only son. His father, Thomas, had died in 1758 when Daniel was just a few years old. Um, but his mother, Hannah, eventually remarries two years later. The Bowie family was large and wealthy with, with um, many cousins and uncles um, and was a prominent force in Maryland politics. Daniel uh, had four first cousins and an uncle who all served in the Maryland legislature. Just to, it just kind of takes a small group, a small sampling. Um, and that includes Robert Bowie, who was governor of Maryland in the early 1800s. So when you look at it, at his life from that context, it would have been more or less expected that Daniel, um, as a young son of the gentry, would become an officer in the army during the Revolutionary War. And indeed, in January 1776, he was commissioned as a first lieutenant, was posted in Annapolis. Four days before the Maryland troops departed, Bowie was promoted to captain of the fourth company, um, made up mostly of men from Hartford County. This is William McMillan's company. Bowie's promotion was certainly an honor. He's now a, a captain in command of, of his own company, but it was not necessarily a favorable posting. Um, Bowie had been in Annapolis all summer, but he, the fourth company had been stationed in Baltimore. And so he may not have met any of his, his men until a day or two before they left, out, they left for New York. The company was well below full strength when he joined them, they had only 58 men, um, so well below the 74 that would have been full strength. They were able to raise seven more men before they left for New York, but that left them with seven new men who had only been in the, uh, 
in the reg in the company for a few days. And so some very raw recruits, maybe not the best addition to the unit. On August 26th, not long before the Marylanders were ordered to cross from Manhattan into Brooklyn, Bowie made out his will, which is seen here. This is his ori the original document. Um, where he makes provisions for if I, as you can see what's highlighted, if I fall on the field of battle, dispersing his property to his friends and his relatives and asking that he be interred at my plantation near Collington, which is uh, near the, uh, the now we're, we now call the Bowie uh, area of Maryland, um, the town of Bowie, the, my, my plantation near Collington in a vault about 20 yards below the vault of my deceased father in a direct line with the garden wall. And this I most earnestly request should my body be attainable, though he knew that it might not be, given the realities of battle. Bowie also manumitted an enslaved man named Basil, who was 21 years old. Um, and when you when you look at their the their ages, um, Basil is someone who might have been who may well have been in service to Bowie um, for both of their young lives. Um, and given that role, it's quite reasonable to guess that Basil may have been in New York with the regiment. During the battle, um, as, as I mentioned, and as McMillan re recounts, um, Bowie was, was mortally wounded, dying in British custody. His will, this, this document, was not delivered to Maryland to be formally filed um, until May 1777, when one of the witnesses was, was finally back in Maryland um, with a chance to bring it to the county court. Whether Bowie was ever buried in his, in his garden near the father he lost as a young child is unknown. Um, but what we know about 18th century battles and about burial in the American Revolution, it's not likely that that would have been possible. We can learn the details of our soldiers' lives in a lot of cases, um, but it's very, very hard to know anything about who they were as people. And one of the few who gives us at least a little bit of a glimpse is Francis Reveille. Reveille was born on August 26, 1753, which I mentioned only because he was in the process of marching to birthday to, to, to Brooklyn on the day he turned 23. He was born in England in Cumberland, um, but his family moved to Virginia when he was about 12. He was a sergeant in the fifth company. Um, so we've heard from one of their officers during the battle. So we know that they were at the uh, head of the Maryland, uh, the line of Marylanders uh, departing the battlefield. Um, he fought well, um, well enough that he was remembered by some of his soldiers um, many years after the battle. Um, and Reveille fought for the whole war. He went on to become an officer in the Light Infantry Corps, um, distinguishing himself in um, the Southern Campaign and at the Battle of Stony Point in 1779. He serves until 1783. Um, and after the war, there's not a whole lot that we know about him, which is actually fairly common for many of our soldiers. They were, they were pretty young, um, hadn't established families for themselves. And I work at the State Archives where what we specialize in are records tape with the government and people who were young, you, you know, he was 23 when he joined, he was 22 when he joined the army and just hadn't done that much with the government yet. We know that in 1786, he wrote a letter to the, to the governor of Maryland volunteering to lead an, exp an expedition uh, uh, to fight Native Americans in Western Maryland, although we don't think that ever happened. And then we know that this, uh, in 1787, occurring in Fredericksburg in, Mar in Virginia, so probably pretty close to where um, Reveille had grown up, where his family had roots. On Saturday last, reported the newspaper, an unhappy recantor took place in this town between Mr. Thompson of Port Royal, also in Virginia, and Mr. Reveille of Baltimore, which nearly terminated the existence of the latter gentleman. Mr. Reveille, conceiving himself injured by some publications and ascertains by Mr. Thompson, called him out, they meet in the store, um, and Reveille begins horsewhipping him on the street. Whereupon, Mr. Thompson drew a pistol, lodged the contents of the pistol into Reveille's breast, um, both men uh, survived the encounter, though uh, Thompson carries the ball with him in his chest until uh, his death. Um, Thompson is taken into custody, as the newspaper notes, though he doesn't seem to ever face charges. 
And Thompson actually um, later loses an arm uh, not long after this, actually, in a duel that he fights with a, a different person. So what are we left? To, what are we left with from this story? What does the story tell us? And it's a little hard to know. We know that it certainly shows us somebody who is hot tempered um, and ready to, to fight. Um, horse whipping somebody in, in 18th century uh, America would have been a very particular way to attack them. This was something that you did to somebody who was not your social equal. So a gentleman would fight a duel against another gentleman. Um, Revely saw himself as being socially above Thompson, and so he, he whipped him. What else do what else can we see from this? Um, are, is this somebody who uh, is violent outbursts of somebody suffering from what we would now think of as post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, maybe, we don't know. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine that there wasn't uh, elements of PTSD among the veterans of the Revolutionary War. The, it's really hard to uncover a lot of that information, but it's reasonable to suspect that that's a factor in at least some of the veterans' lives. In the 1780s and in, in, in the 18th century in general, there's much more acceptance of, of violence as, a, as sort of a, a public uh, a public event. So there's also possibly there as well. Or maybe Reveille was just an aggressive guy. Maybe Reveille was, was looking for trouble. It's hard to know. Um, but it's a fascinating incident. And it's one of a few that we have that kind of show his personality. So the last person to talk about um, captures what I think of as the small stories of, of our troops. Um, the, the sort of ordinary experiences of, of everyday lives. And so this is Martin Kephart. Kephart um, enlisted from Western Maryland, um, out in Frederick County. He was part of the large ethnic German community. There's some indication that he may have been um, himself an immigrant from Germany. He was born in the 1750s, in, in, depending on where exactly that is, depending on, on which birth that you want to believe. Many members of the German community out in Western Maryland and in the mountains of Pennsylvania and Virginia, and it's really all one area, sir, later served in the German battalion that was raised there. Um, Kephart joined the 9th Company, which was raised in Western Maryland um, in 17, January 1776, before there was a German battalion even. There was another Kephart, uh, George Kephart, in the company with Martin. Um, we don't know enough about them to say if they're related. The 9th was commanded by Captain George Stricker, who was um, of Swiss, Swiss German ethnicity. They were designated the Light Infantry Company for the Maryland Regiment. Um, and it's sort of interesting to note that the regiment that early in the war had its own Light Infantry Company. That the, these were people who would have been um, expected to serve as uh, skirmishers or as scouts or to set um, positioned in advanced uh, areas of the battlefield. They were also issued with rifles. The only rifle unit that Maryland had in 1776 um, the, the only rifled company in, in the 1st Maryland Regiment. Um, and the use of rifles made some sense during, um, in, a light, in a light infantry company, um, would not have worked very well in a regular line company. Um, Thomas Johnston, who was the governor of Maryland, wrote, Stricker has accepted his commission and has had good success in enlisting uh, his troops. He proposes to be very particular in the men he takes and his, the Light Infantry Company, to be armed with rifles. And rifles would have been already at that time very much cons um, part of that sort of backcountry mountain man uh, image um, of the people out on the frontier with their long rifles. Um, that's what they marched with. It's possible that part of the reason they, they were armed with rifles is because they already had rifles um, in their homes um, they wouldn't have tried to try to find the muskets. The state didn't really have enough weapons for all of their soldiers. It's coming. There's another slide. Oh. Come on. Sorry, my computer lagged for a moment. So Keppert fights at the Battle of um, Brooklyn 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have showed you this earlier. So this area, here's Maryland once again. And this area in red, sort of the panhandle um, out in the mountains, is would all have been sort of um, the area where the, the, the Germans lived in Maryland and where Stricker raised his company, where Kephart and his comrades were from. Kephart survived the Battle of the Brooklyn. Um, he manages to escape away uh, unharmed. Um, though his company itself takes very heavy losses. They lost, um, about two thirds of their soldiers were lost. As from his pension, he, in his pension application um, for the federal government, he later recounted that he was in the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of White Plains, the Battle of Trenton, where Washington conquered the Hessians, as he recalled, the Battle of Princetown, the Battle of Monmouth, the Battle of Brandywine, and in the Battle of Germantown. Um, he was wounded in the thigh with a musket ball at Princeton, um, that shot is yet in his body, though it did not stop him from continuing to serve. He was in a rifle company, uh, recalled Kephart, for one year, and then the company was made into a musket company. Um, Washington and the Continental Army in general really didn't have much interest in, in, in riflemen after 1776. Um, Kephart served until 1779. On December 27th, he's discharged. Um, like most of the veterans from 1776. He may have gone home to Maryland, though if he did, he wasn't in the state for very long. And by the 1780s, he was out of town. He, he had left the state, possibly settling first in Greencastle, uh, Pennsylvania, which is not far from the Maryland line, um, but eventually making his way further west to Osnaburg, Ohio, now in Stark County, um, now uh, East Canton, Ohio. It's a region that was settled by a, many people of German origin, uh, many people from who had been in Western Pennsylvania, gradually working their way further west. Osnaburg uh, had dreamed of being coming the county seat, um, which it never did. That was Canton, Ohio became the, the county seat. Um, and the town never really much developed. You can, this map from 18, 1875, so almost 70 years after uh, Kephart gets there, there are really not that many buildings in town still. But it's a place with enough of a town that there's work for Kephart. Um, Kephart was a cooper, which is a, a very fruitful trade. Um, and though he never became rich, it was probably um, a trade which gave him the ability to support his family. He had a wife and at least two daughters. Um, one of whom we know was blind from birth. We don't know the names of uh, the wife or the children, um, though it is very likely that one of those three was named Margaret. There's a Margaret in mention in some of the probate proceedings. And can't tell if she's a daughter or the wife. In 1818, he applied for a federal veterans pension. Um, he was a, where he described how he was a, by profession a cooper, but from old age, and infirmity, he is unable to work any at all. And that he has been severely attacked with the palsy. He's severely confined to bed. His oldest child is blind and has been since, his inf since her infantry, infancy. In 1818, he receives a pension, um, which he takes until it gets until his death. Um, sort of in the... Uh, in the summer of 1832. Um, all told, he received pension payments of uh, over $1,300, which would not have been a lot of money necessarily, but would have been enough to keep his family uh, sustained and supported um, as sort of a tangible way that the Revolutionary War um, sustained him and supported his life. But more than, more than just that, we know that the, the, it's easy to see how, as a Revolutionary veteran, he is financially supported. But we also get some sense of what it does to his place in society. In 1826, um, at the July 4th parade in Canton, um, so the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, Kephart joined seven other veterans um, in their, their 4th of July parade, marching right at the front of the, the parade, a spot of honor, where they were covered by a flag and escorted by a military guard. 
you can see them among them. There's all these, these old men, William Capes, aged 83, Casper Stoner, aged 70, Martin Kephart, aged 88. This is a, a fitting way to honor these people on that, that, that 50th anniversary of the Declaration. Um, you, you can imagine these, these very old, very proud men. You don't want to dress up the past too much. You don't want to be too sentimental about these things. Um, there's a may have been a bittersweet moment for some of them, but it still, I think, is a, a very nice way to remember them. So these are just some of the samples of the lives that we have. Um, many of the, the stories that we have are much sparser than we can tell, tell you about Kephart. Um, for, only, for half of, the, the, of our soldiers, we don't know more than the fact that they served in the army in 1776. Um, but it's really important to us to tell as much as we can, to tell, to describe the famous men like John Hoskins Stone, um, the small stories like Kephart, or the men for whom we know only the date of their enlistment. It's a way for us to bear witness to their lives. Um, and something that I was really struck with when I first started working on this. Um, and you know, I'm, I've been a historian for, for, for a long time and I'm, I'm kind of jaded about a lot of things, but it kind of struck me that we were studying people who maybe hadn't been thought about in, in 200 years. Um, and so I think it, it was, our work is really important to us and to describe as much of their life as we can. So thank you very much for, for watching today. Um, questions, I'll answer some now, uh, but please reach out through our website uh, and, and do take some time to, to take a look. Oh, and thank you so much. And yes, we historians are a jaded people, are we not? So we have um, a couple questions, it looks like, here for you. Um, and it's interesting, you know, the Marylanders, they're going to fight in so many of the major campaigns. You know, they'll be down in the Southern Theater, especially, you know, um, down in Camden, Guilford Courthouse, other places there. Um, so that they, they have a long and storied um, service with the, with the Continental Army. Um, you know, Baltimore, if you go to Baltimore, Utah Street's named after Utah Springs, um, Camden, yeah. Lexington, Saratoga, there's all kinds of Rebel War streets um, that they carry back. So wait with a few questions and then let you go. Um, so uh, one question is, how were the Marylanders uniformed and equipped? Ah, an excellent question. Um, there is a little bit of controversy, um, but the answer is actually pretty clear. So they were dressed in hunting shirts officially. So sort of, I, I should have a picture. This is not the first time I, I've been asked this question. Um, so um, fringe sort of cheaply produced linen garments. If you, if you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, you'll get lots of pictures. Um, the basic idea was that it was clothing that people could obtain cheaply from the state or that they had already. We, it also seems like from some of the records um, and from some deserter notices that people just marched off and fought in whatever clothing they had, either what they took from home, what they acquired um, on the march or as the campaign went on. It's not really till, till the next year that they get those, those famous blue shirts. And even then there seems to be some doubt as to how many of them had, had actual uniforms. Some of the companies um, from Maryland had particular colors of hunting shirt. Um, you know, some of the officers outfitted them um, with specific colors. One of them, the fourth independent company from uh, Halbert County on the Eastern shore had purple hunting shirts with red cuffs, um, red collars and sort of, excuse me, um, purple cuffs and purple collars and sort of um, like must've been a half cape on the back, which is really just a remarkable thing. You would love to see that. There are a few accounts, and you may see these if you read about the Marylanders, talking about them wearing red uniforms. And it is extraordinarily unlikely that such uniforms ever existed or that they found their way on into the Maryland line or on the battlefield at Brooklyn. There were some men who had fought in the Baltimore Independent Cadets, um, which is Mordecai Gist's militia unit um, raised in Baltimore. And some of the officers had been in, in the unit before there was a 1st Maryland Regiment. And the cadets did have red uniforms. 
And so there is an account of men in red uniforms from Maryland marching through Philadelphia um, in the summer of 76. And it is conceivable that some of them had worn their old cadet uniforms on their way up to New York so that they would look better. That's possible, um, but there are equal accounts which say that um, the Marylanders from uh, Colonel to Private uh, were outfitted in hunting shirts. Um, and we know the state taught, they, they talk in the records about what they were wearing. So it's, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear that they were wearing either hunting shirts or whatever they happened to bring with them. Yeah, a, a Revolutionary War army is going to be a hodgepodge of colors, especially on the American <laughs> side. It's, it's tough to figure out who's fighting with whom because they'll have, you know, even whenever you're a continental, you, you have the blue coat, but you'll have different facings uh, on your cuffs or on your facings of your collar and things to try to figure it out. I know the second Maryland, when they come out later on in the war, they're, they're supposed to be in blue, but they're brown because they ran out yeah, of the eye. Nice. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a real hodgepodge. Um, you people know, people who run out of clothing or whose officers just like a better color. And so they give them better, better looking uh, uh, coats. That kind yeah, of yeah, that's always a, the best way to do it when you have a rich officer who can help you out. Um, let's see here. The next question we have, let me take a look um, up here. As the practice in the Civil War, officers were elected by the soldiers themselves. Was this so in the Revolutionary War? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, in some places it was, it was the practice and not in others. Um, in some places it was more, they were elected more freely, more freely than in others. Um, Washington complained endlessly that the New England units popularly elected all of their officers. Um, in Maryland, there seems to have been kind of a hybrid, um, at least initially, where there may have, the, the um, soldiers in the unit may have had some choice or some say in the matter, but for the most part, they were chosen, at least officially chosen um, by the state legislature. Um, so that the, the officers of the first Maryland, of, of Smallwood's men, were in theory elected by the by the Maryland Convention. Whether there had how they were their names were put forward isn't a hundred percent clear. Um, we know that some of Maryland the Maryland, Maryland militia units who, who are serving in the state um, do elect their officers, um, but I do not think they were. It was the kind of election where anyone has the opportunity to run and could get elected captain. That it was either formally or sort of just by general consensus. There are a few rich, well-known, prominent leaders in the community who could get elected. And that's who's, who you have to choose from. Um, let's see, I'll give you two more. Um, do you remember any of the 400 uh, that you followed who may have uh, later fought at the Battle of Guilford College? I believe they mean the Battle of Guilford Courthouse since Guilford College didn't exist yet. <laughs> Um, offhand, I would have trouble coming up with too many names, although we know some of the, there, there are a number of men who, who are in the army that long. Um, and I don't want to get this wrong. I know at least one, I'm almost positive that there's a gentleman, a soldier named Edward Edgerly, who served, who was killed at Guilford. Um, he had served since 1776. Um, I'm pretty sure he's the right person. Uh, his story comes to mind because he had, his wife had died sometime before the war um, and he had a young son. And after the war, um, after his death, some of his, um, his colleagues, some of his, his, his fellow officers came together and petitioned the, the Maryland legislature to essentially establish a trust fund for his now orphaned son um, who was to receive um, his uh, Edgerly's uh, back pay um, when he turned 21. Um, and in the intervening years, he was supposed to get the interest on the back pay to help support his education, um, which is a remarkable event for, for anybody. Um, most of these people, even officers, didn't see their pay at all or, or only rarely. So it was a pretty, pretty remarkable event. And it, I think it tells us a little bit about who Edgerly was. He must've been a pretty remarkable person. 
Yeah, and by Guilford Courthouse, I mean, ever, they've been so consolidated down, especially the, the first Maryland, whenever they're fighting there, you have the first and second Maryland, the second comes along much later on. And ironically, their officers were completely swapped out by Green and the officers of the first when we were down there. So it's kind of two for one there. Um, if you're looking for how officers were elected, and they were sometimes forced upon the regiments too. Um, yeah, so actually, actually, so that, that's a, actually a great, a great, uh, a great point to, to bring up. Um, is one of the the odder stories is um, in this beginning of 1780, Maryland is getting hit up by the con by by the Congress for more soldiers. Um, Maryland is pretty strapped for men at this point, but they agree that they will raise this thing called the Regiment Extraordinary which is going to be um, kind of anyone they can get. And so it's intended to be um, recently discharged veterans um, from the Maryland line. So, so many of the men from the Maryland 400 would have been eligible um, deserters, convicts, or anyone who they can scrape up together. And a lot of the officers for it are appointed who had been just discharged um, from the, the veterans of 76 who had just been discharged very few of those men had been officers previously. And so when they show up in, in North Carolina with this new group of soldiers, the, the rest of the army of the Maryland uh, line refuses to fight with them. They won't let them take their positions because they have been appointed as officers out of order. Maryland um, had a, when it came to promotions, had a very rigid hierarchy. Um, if you've poked around on some of the documents on fold three, um, there's a list and Maryland promoted men by list a lot of the time. And these were men who had not been promoted according to the list. And so a lot of them actually got sent home. <laughs> the, the private, some of the privates, but a lot of the officers were sent home because they couldn't keep their rank. And um, so a, a question about Fort Lee, New Jersey in the summer and fall of 76, do you have any information about any of the Maryland service members that may have served there? About where in New Jersey? I'm sorry. Fort Lee. Um, not specifically. Um, I'm trying to think. The exact whereabouts of the Maryland units, um, sort of in that period in New York, it's not. You can't always find them on a day-to-day -day basis, or exactly where they were. Um, it's likely that there were Marylanders stationed at Fort Lee. Um, just as there were Marylanders stationed at Fort Washington. Um, but the, in addition to small women, so the men who I spent all my time talking about, there would have been people from the flying camp, um, some 3,500 uh, other soldiers. Um, and one thing that happens is the army is so busy and the Marylanders in particular are so busy sort of existing on a day-to-day -day basis that they don't keep good records. Um, so this may be one of those cases. Um, whenever I can't find something, I just remember that Smallwood writes a letter back to Maryland Mar saying that they have sent all of the records to Philadelphia for safekeeping so that they can't be captured in the event that the Marylanders are, are taken prisoners or that they lose their luggage. Um, so a lot of this stuff, we can kind of make a guess, but we just don't really know. Yeah, it, it's extraordinarily hard to uh, lock down any officer who's not a Green, a Washington, or anything on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it really is. Um, we were talking about that in an earlier session. And this will be the last one I hit you with, Owen. Um, how did Black Marylanders fare in the Southern campaigns? Uh, were there any incidents with local slaveholders that you're aware of? Mm, that's a really interesting question. Um, it is not one that I know a lot about, unfortunately. Um, I'm so kind of, of, of mono-focused on this one group of guys sometimes. Um, we know that, so we know there were black soldiers and we, we know that they would have fought um, at the Southern camp, in the Southern campaign. I know there is an, there are at least a few sort of anecdotes that mention them. Um, there's an incident where I believe four of them are, cap, are arrested for accused of theft or something like that. Um, and the details of that escape me. Um, it's, an, it's a, the topic of, um, of black soldiers in the Continental Army is one which has had a, some very good uh, research on. Um, so if you wanna know more, I think the best in the most recent book would be Standing in Their Own Light um, by Judith Van Buskirk. So give that a Google, give that a read if you, if you wanna know a lot more about that topic.
Yeah, and John Reese also um, did a book yes, recently. Absolutely. Um, and he actually wrote a few articles for battlefields.org. So you can head over there and learn more about like Lord Dunmore's that's, that's Ethiopian right, yes. and some other things like uh, other topics of that nature. Um, and John's writing a few more for us. We'll just uh, get those into our hopper here soon. Just waiting on those. So Owen, I'm not going to take up any more of your time today. We want to thank you for uh, being part of our virtual conference. And we really appreciate it. 